Hi, Craig. Hello, Craig. You're not Jay. <laughs> you don't know that. <laughs> I see right through your illusions. <laughs> uh, I'm Grumpy Dungeon Master Christopher. This is uh, my player, or one of my players, Dimitri. Uh, Grumpy Dungeon Master Jay is dead. I killed him. Uh, I buried him out back behind the tree. For legal reasons, I won't confirm that. Okay, good. So, since uh, you're filling in for Jay this week, and possibly indefinitely, until we res him, you know, necromancy is just as good as revive, right? Absolutely. Um... For the people who don't watch our stream, uh, why don't you just go ahead and introduce who you are and how you relate to me, pretty much just i.e. the stream, and who you play on that. Sure. I'm Dimitri. I've been playing D&D for 25-odd years now, um, but local to Chris, and on the D&D stream, I play Doc currently. Yeah, and we just finished our like finale episode for part one, which was Waterdeep Feed Your Summer. Um, we did you have a good time with the with the whole like campaign setting? We don't normally get the player perspective, just a DM perspective. Yeah, absolutely, it was great. Um, very I'll cool remix. Line. True. Very cool remix. We were saved by some amazingly bad rolls on some of the enemy's parts, but... Uh, you have no idea. Like, so... In in, in the finale, the, the big bad boss, he was supposed to go turn invisible at the end, after... At, bleh, bleh, bleh. So, getting my words straight. At the end of his turn, after he cast a spell or attacked... Twice a day, he could turn invisible. And I forgot to do that when he teleported up to you guys. So he's supposed to teleport up there and just become invisible. <laughs> and then he couldn't be targeted. So, But when he did get targeted, even with his plus seven to wisdom saving throws, he kept getting hold personed the entire time. And it just... It was amazing. It just ruined the encounter for me. <laughs> And then I kept forgetting to do the stupid haste action with the, the Cambian Demon. Um, the fireballs that messed you guys up. If that if that big bad had gotten at least one round's worth of attacks in, I'm pretty sure they would have won. Oh, but, no doubt. Yeah. I mean, you ever get into that situation as a DM? Because I know you've DM'd quite a bit, and I know you're a player in my games, but you've DM'd a lot. How often does how often do you get stuck in that predicament where the players are just gonna lose? Um, well, more often than I'd like to admit, but um, sometimes you gotta fudge it. Sometimes you gotta let the dice happen. Yeah, I, I don't fudge all that often. I just kind of let things go, and I guess I'm cruel that way. Yeah, we know what we're getting into with you. <laughs> That's true. So um, let's talk about the most deadly uh, NPC, the most deadly monster that we had in our campaign. The Succubunny, yes. The uh, Succubunny. Heron gun appearing Succubus that killed, they had both of the kills in that campaign. Mm -hmm. And from all the games I've played with you, other than Strahd, I think that's the only enemy that managed to kill multiple characters in separate occasions. Yeah, I was quite surprised that it worked the way it did. I mean, granted, the, the Succubus charm isn't as potent as the, uh, the Cambion charm is, which is kind of odd in a way, but it still worked pretty well and i killed the two low wisdom save characters i don't think she would ever be able to like kill one high wisdom save characters even though tough. she does get yeah even though she does get that free kiss the charm effect the second that fails you guys would just know it and just would murder the crap out of her 
but yeah, it was it's very interesting. Like one one monster it doesn't as long as it's played right can just seem to destroy most of a campaign altogether. If you really wanted to, like a dragon is obvious, you know, just fire breath and devour people, whatever. But you know, charming somebody, having them do your dirty work, and then coming home and getting a kiss and dying horribly. That's a that's kind of a new one for me. <laughs> well, it, it's a two part problem. One is most of the enemies are geared around doing damage in some way as their means of interaction. So you throw something that's not on that axis and it causes a lot more problems and they swing way above their weight class. On the other hand of it, you have 5th edition's relatively static saves. So um, without a feat, most characters are proficient in two saves, and the ones they aren't proficient in never change. So if you start with a plus zero or minus one, that save's always going to be bad. Yeah. And uh, that's why a lot of people don't take that, at least from a wisdom standpoint. I know we were talking a while ago about like what what spells like what what spells hit the most what's the most common attribute that spells hit and it wasn't wisdom oddly enough but it feels like it is wisdom like pretty much all the bad stuff is in the wisdom category so every player that i ever play with like especially in adventures league always like bump up wisdom through the roof i can't tell you how many barbarians i have had at my table that have like a huge dex a huge con or a huge strength and a huge con, and then like a massive wisdom to carry it up as, you know? <laughs> like the yeah. one thing I should be able to hit them with, and just, oh, it fails. I have, I have an 18 wisdom. What are you talking about? <laughs> What's your con? 16. What about your dex? 14. Why is your wisdom so high? So I don't die. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, that's also the thing. They may not be the most common. They are common, but when you fail, you fail hard. Yeah. So, so overall, with uh, with playing, you played through my original campaign when I did Waterdeep Dragon Heist originally, and I pretty much played that one straight by the book without any kind of tuning at all, and that went pretty well, I think. We did it over the table well before we were streaming and anything like that, and so when we played Waterdeep Feature Summer, I brought your old character back. Uh, how'd you feel about that? Well, that's still a mystery that I'm not fully certain about. Um, but ha having Doc 1.0 around, that's pretty cool. Just like having uh, Shelley's first drow back around. And the consequences of everything they got up to are interesting. Um, having the other Docs around, that I'm not sure about. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you pretty much seeded that idea with like, when you you had Doc 1.0, and you're like, I don't know what to play, so I'm just going to play Doc again and make up Doc 2.0. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to use that going forward. That was a backstory you gave me, so I had to come up with something. You know, uh, Doc's a so, really fun character to play, in my <laughs> defense. <laughs> you played you played the previous one like on the good spectrum, and you played this one on the evil spectrum. Is that is that any different for you, or just kind of just still playing the same character? Just I think it might it? I think it might be circumstances. Honestly, uh, it's what opportunities are there. So the first one was kind of pulled off of Hawkeye from Mash, which shows my age a little bit. Um, but Doc Two started at the same point, but. I wasn't even intentionally trying to get involved with the Centaurum or anything, but once I did, well, there we go. Yeah, that has been interesting, trying to work that in, because I really didn't use them too much, other than just as a, you know, related faction to uh, the Xanathar Guild. You know, just being the thugs and trash that you fight, and now actually having to, like, read more about them has been quite interesting, and see, I never actually use them at all in anything like when coming from fourth edition they had a whole different world before it wasn't forgotten realms until much much later when i really wasn't playing fourth that much anymore so now being in fifth edition and kind of like seeing forgotten realms in its full glory jesus the, the centaurum is a hell of a hole to go down into 
Oh, Because yeah. then he hit, like, all the Manchun stuff and <laughs> all the dragon stuff and all the cult stuff. And, like, it, it goes on for a while. I can see why there's so many books out for it. Yeah. So, online, being a player that plays over the table online, what, what's your preference? In person. I mean, yeah. it, the... It, the kinesthetics of it, you can't touch that online, even with the best virtual tabletop out there. Um, and you notice the one thing I can't give up is the physical dice. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, you, you have for too far. Rules. You have I, for I have. Rules. <laughs> I have, and that gets me constant twos. <laughs> Well, have you bought custom digital dice yet? I haven't. That might be your problem. You gotta spend the money, man. Yeah, and d d Beyond just uh, weighs the random generator. <laughs> Actually, it's not a random generator. Oh, yeah, it does physically simulate it, doesn't it? Yeah, so... I think I talked about this like a, like maybe two years ago on the podcast, but on the D and D Beyond Dice app, uh, will actually generate a three D object inside of a three D box it puts on your screen, and then it throws the dice uh, from a random starting position, the die starting position like what numbers facing up, and then what direction the dice gets tossed, and then it bounces around in the box. So they actually went kind of like a step above. Instead of just making a random number and pulling it out and getting it to you, the actual dice are random. I kind of wonder too with like the newer digital dice that they have, if like the new like there's a there's a Thumber Child one out there right now, which looks like a dragon scale, but it all has like these little tiny spikies on it. Like I wonder if those little tiny spikes also are part of the 3D model and affect the the physical bouncing of the dice at all. Be interesting to know if that actually is that way or not, but since they stopped their development ch- developer chat, I can't ask the questions anymore. But it'd be, it'd be interesting to know. I'm going to assume no, because modeling yeah. a platonic solid inside of a platonic solid is much easier than something with spiky bits. Yeah, but I mean, that's I really like the fact that they went that far to kind of duplicate how physical dice actually work. So it does feel better in my opinion, versus like using Foundry's digital dice, which just basically rolls a number and like adds an animation to it. But overall, I think it's, I haven't seen much of an issue. And also because I play with a cat on my arm, rolling physical dice at the table now for me when, when streaming is like the hardest thing because I can't move one arm. And then I have to use my other arm for the mouse to kind of go between all the windows. <laughs> Well, just put so. the mouse on the floor and use your foot. Multitask like a real man. Come on. <laughs> um, so as a player to a DM, um, and you're you're essentially my rules lawyer at the table, um, my wife got a critical shot on the other big bad at the end, and I was questioning whether or not the poison on the the dart that she fired would also have criti- critical because it was an additional effect on the attack. And, you know, you're my rules lawyer, so usually you come up with the, 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 the raw answer fairly quickly, and you did this time too. And I had already ruled in my head that the, that the poison was going to stack. And then you read it, uh, which you confirmed that all the dice do get doubled as, as long as they're part of the attack. But I knew there was something wrong in my head that I still had to go out and figure out. And it's if the poison was a save effect. Right. The save effect wouldn't get doubled. Absolutely. Because, like, because I knew that I knew something was wrong in my head when she did that and asked the question. But I just couldn't remember, you know, from a DM perspective. I just couldn't remember what the exact rule was. And I'm always going to, if I can't remember something, I try to toss it to the player in the best case, hence why she got it doubled without even knowing what the real answer was. But I had to go back and look that up. And yeah. then like, even, even Crawford's answer is the most open-ended response to it ever. Of course it is. 
give me give me a second. I'll I'll find it again. Um. But how does it feel being my my uh, my rules lawyer at the table? Well, I try to be fair, and a lot of those have gone against the players, but. I'm okay with it. I'm familiar with that sort of role on table and off table. Yeah. I I try to always, you know, go for the for the for the player whenever I can. All right. So the question was posed to Jeremy Crawford, damage poisons. If you crit with a poison coated weapon, do you double the poison dice because crit or not because saving throw? And then his response was, the intent is no. The saving throw, not the attack, determines whether the poison takes effect after a hit. And that's a very straightforward answer, right? Yeah. It makes sense. A year prior to that, the same question was asked. Okay? Um, If I'm bitten by a snake and it criticals, does the poison damage critical as well? And his response was, any damage dice delivered by a critical hit as opposed to a saving throw are rolled twice. So, very kind of ambiguous. Like, I understand what he was trying to say, but at least the second time he said it was more clear because the snake has to bite you and then, like, inject the poison. So it was an attack, right? But you don't really think of the saving throw being not part of the attack. So crit, so... I don't know. Yeah. Just, but yeah, like I, an imp's sting where it's damage plus a save and on a fail, there's poison. Yeah, you don't double the poison dice there. Oh, and I, I caught that snide remark later on. It's like, I don't know what it is. It couldn't have been an imp because I didn't have to <laughs> get a saving throw on it. I just forgot about the saving throw. I just rolled a little damage. <laughs> there, uh, yeah, having... I won't say an encyclopedic knowledge because you have get pulled out some obscure ones in later books that I haven't even recognized, but I, I recognize a lot of these without looking them up. I was like, no, you're getting this poison damage. It's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a- as a player for the, for my game, is there anything that I did and you can be honest here. I, I can take critique. Anything that I did that you think I should have done differently or better? Because we don't really get this perspective that often on the podcast. Oh, this is true. Um, well, the one thing I'll say, and I kind of let this go in character fairly often, is we didn't have a ton of reason to be working for Barnabas other than it moved the plot along. He... Uh, coerced us the first time and then until the very end we kept not getting paid (laughs) it's just like i I was almost to the point of going in character you know i shouldn't be helping giving you advice on this but you're really bad at blackmailing people and it's kind of starting to offend me (laughs) so the funny part about that is, is I realized that after like the second or third time that I don't did it to you, that I'm just kind of like, shoot, he's the main, he's the main quest. And I'm kind of just expecting you guys to kind of follow along with it. And so like, I kind of want to see how far I could push that <laughs> before someone went, no, we're not yeah. doing any more shit for you until you pay us or something. So. Um, I, I realize I realized that it, like I said, like at the second or third time. But I, then I was just kind of like, I'm gonna do it until someone says something, <laughs> like in, <Awesome>. in play. <laughs> yeah, but, we keep making, let's say, morally ambiguous and be generous characters and groups. So next yeah. time I have to play a lawful good paladin or something. It also does feel that way too. Like all the groups I play with, no matter what, always become morally ambiguous, and that's got to be something that I'm doing like wrong or right, depending on your perspective, I guess. Because like even like the Icewind Dale thing, man, that just went so south so fast. If Shelley hadn't died early, we would have been on a completely different path. 
Right. We can't just always use my wife though as like the the, the mom gauge of like if we're doing good or evil things. But, well, the first water deep <laughs> pain we really couldn't. That's that's fair. Yeah, the first water deep group was just straight up murder hobos. Um, and the second group, you guys kind of were going that way, but I tried to stop that a little bit through Barnabas, you know, wanting you guys not to kill anybody. And also kind of give you guys a little bit more like challenge with the fights. Cause I kind of figured you guys are all experienced players. You can walk into an encounter and just bludgeon everybody to death. That's not going to be hard. But now I want you to think about it. So no fire spells, no, um, no killing people. Now what are you going to do? And it's then there's challenge it, it, run. Yeah. Then it became a game of, are you a water deep citizen? What? Stab. <laughs> he didn't I, say I, yes. I think Doc is, let's be honest, evil as he was going was actually the most focused on non-lethal out of the group. Yeah. That's but, true. That's actually one of the things I don't I dislike about fifth edition is the lack of non-lethal options. Because three point five Pathfinder, tons of options. I actually had a really cool build for um just stacking non-lethal bonuses on one Pathfinder character that was I don't know, Mike Tyson basically. Yeah. Just punching people and knocking them out. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure Mike Tyson in real life could just punch a commenter and they would just explode into like a pink paste. Well, that was kind of the thing when you're dealing 97 non-lethal damage in an attack, suddenly things just die. <laughs> non-lethally. Yeah, if you punch a commoner for 97 damage non-lethally, they're still dead in my opinion. I don't care that you said non-lethally. I, I get the joke. I'm going to cleave them in half non-lethally, but... No. My my no. very first game of Pathfinder session game one session one, we had the lawful good pacifist cleric and there were some bandits and we wanted to capture one to interrogate and the cleric walks up to hit him with their stick and crits and. <laughs> rolls maximum damage and just instant kills the bandit. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. I think they just created they just created that non-lethal rule and we're just like, yeah, that's good enough. You Who's going to want to not kill things? Come on. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember what he did for fourth. Uh, whoever reduces a creature to zero hit points or below may opt to have it knocked unconscious instead of killed. There is otherwise no distinction between lethal and non-lethal damage in the game. So pretty much the same thing as 5th edition. Yeah, and that's lame. It, it kind of is. Like I said, you wanted a blackjack, and that's just a club, essentially. Yeah. You know, it just does non-lethal damage. I'm fine with that. The, the boxing glove arrow? It's a little ridiculous, <laughs> but if you spend the gold i don't care it's an uncom now it's a common magic item yeah so i i always go back to why don't they have these things like is it really they're paying is it really that much expensive to add another paragraph that has these options in there add one more page to their dungeon master make guide to really is it really going to break the bank for them you know and i know I know the answer is always like you're the DM. You can just make it up, but I'm just. But what tired are we of paying you? For, what are you? We paying you for if the answer is just figure it out yourself. Yeah, and I, I keep falling into that more and more and more too, especially with you know the six six edition or five point five, whatever they're going to call it, is right around the corner. I. I don't see any of the problems that I'm we've been toting on the podcast or people I've been hearing people talk about as problems, you know, being resolved. I just see classes being tweaked and yeah. giving force damage to you know, resistance to barbarians. Ooh, that fucking why? Well, yeah. 
they like they say we're gonna we're gonna change weapons and they give them different proficiencies now. Ooh. Okay, some of the know. weapons tricks are kind of cool. Yeah, I, I get it, but it's not enough. No. And we're not gonna go over to UA in this this episode. Jay wants to talk about yeah. it, so we're gonna wait till he comes back. But it's just it's just not enough. Or if it is enough, it's too little, too late. Yeah. People have already written that stuff down and put it on DMs Guild for people to use. And it's better than what we might get from wizards. Yeah, I really don't understand. Like I said, I was watching some kind of podcast or TikTok, and they were talking about how, like, right now, WotC and D&D is at such a weird kind of, like, wobbly, like, precipice of disaster. All these new systems are basically coming out with new books. You know, we have Paizo coming out with their new second edition remaster book. We have Cobalt Press coming out with Thurs. You know, there's other people out there making other systems or other 5e content. Luke Gygax is a Kickstarter on right now for his homebrew world and content. Um, there's so much going on right now. And all these people are out there saying, Hey, we want you to buy our books and keep playing fifth edition, but with these changes or, you know, play our books instead. It's a whole brand new system. It's all full of D sixes instead of D twenties. And now here's Watsy going, Hey, buy these same books again. They're just a little different than the ones you already have. No one's really going to do that. And they're just... totally compatible, and we're just going to call it Dungeon Master's Guide again. That won't be confusing at all, right? So, like, so you as you as a, you as a consumer, okay, you're a player. You buy all the D and D books. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have a hobby. I do. I have a bookshelf that's completely full and uh, pushing into other bookshelves now. <laughs> So, like, a- as a player, if six or six edition D and Done five point five comes out, let's say it comes out January fifteenth, twenty twenty four. At the same time, also on January fifteenth, twenty twenty four, Cobalt Press comes out with their new five E adjacent system, and Paizo comes out with Pathfinder two point five. Um. And let's just say some other system comes out with a another tabletop RPG system that's a D100 system. One comes out with a D6 system, all on January fifteenth, twenty twenty four. And you had to buy one. Which one are you gonna buy? Honestly, Cobbled Press. Yeah. I've had enough Pathfinder, uh, Watsy with really it was the Spelljammer package that just killed my enthusiasm because I love that setting and it was just <laughs> what we got which really makes me worried for the Planescape one but yeah but I've liked what Cobbled Press has put out traditionally I've had enough Pathfinder kind of depends on the other systems because there's some cool uh, base ideas out there yeah um, one of my friends of the previous guests guests on the podcast they found another system that came out in 2016 um that's kind of like a blend of fourth edition and fifth edition but with a kind of like doom slash diablo aesthetic let's see if we can find the name of it real quick i'll be honest i've kind of been wanting to go find some of the older deadlands books just because it was kind of a cool system and it was a really cool setting yeah and like even like the older um uh dark sun books like there's oh yeah got a couple of the second edition ones no, and I'm glad they won't because I don't want to see what current Wizards of the Coast would do to Dark Sun. All right, so first off, all the desert, it's now just like flower gardens. Halflings are no longer cannibals. Halflings are no longer cannibals, they only eat potatoes. Yes. Potato only diet. 
Um, if you want to take metal armor, you can just take metal armor. It's fine. No one cares. <laughs> so for those that don't know, there's no metal on Dark Side. <laughs> or very little. Extremely little. Yeah, I got I got metal for you. You want some metal? <laughs> oh, crap. I gotta find this now. It's gonna kill me. Talk about something. Give me a second. Ah, yeah, my fi- oh, so my favorite setting that I've never gotten to play in, and I have most of the books, is Dragon Mech, which is a I think it was 3.0 setting, and there's backwards compatibility for you there. But it was Majora's Mask in D D with giant robots. Huh. Yeah. So, moon's crashing down. There are very few clerics and paladins, and especially high-level ones, because the reason the moon's crashing down is the gods on the moon and the lunar dragons are at war with the... I forget the planet's name. The earthly gods and dragons. So... spiritually powerful people they could get, which means they're pulling all that away. And if your high-level cleric that you did manage to make did die, they could just couldn't come back because <laughs> they weren't going to be allowed to come back. But then you had giant robots and walking city-sized mechs and things, and it was cool. Technically complicated as all get out. <laughs> when you're talking about getting a crew for your robot <laughs> yeah that's, that's why i always wanted to play uh rogue trader it's been one like one of the on one of the systems on my list like to build a build a crew and to go out and do missions but also have this giant rogue trader it's basically a floating city and have it you have all the adventures and stuff that match up to it yeah i found i found the system it was called yeah. shadow of the demon lord huh. It it was made by uh, Robert Schwab. I'm saying his name right. Um, I guess he was a developer on fourth edition and fifth edition for a little bit. So he kind of made Shadow of the Demon Lord. I've, I've looked at some of the PDFs online, and pretty much it's a little bit of fourth edition, a little bit of fifth edition, kind of merged together with like a hardcore difficulty and job classes and a bunch of other really cool things. Like I really kind of want to try that system out someday, but like I said, like at this point in time, there's so many really cool systems out there. Oh, yeah. Why go to five point five? Yeah. We want you to buy the fighter class again, but he's different now. And now proper monetization. We're going to be releasing classes one by one as DLC. Right. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me. Instead of books, just single character archetypes as DLC for D and D Beyond. <laughs> yeah, and, and who knows what they're going to retcon in the new books? You know, being that they got rid of the Mordekainens and Volos guy, you know, yeah. completely. You can't buy those anymore. They're not published anymore. They kept saying like, "Oh, we're not going to come in and take your books from you." That's impossible. But you know, I I can access them through D and D Beyond still, but it's terrible. It's clunky. To use we them. all knew they were lying. Well, I mean, it's still there. So technically, they didn't lie. But I guarantee you that the VTT that they use is only going to be compatible with uh, 5.5. It's not going to work with the old 5.0 books. Yeah. Because they didn't promise you that the VTT was going to work with the older stuff. Just that the older stuff is backwards compatible for your home table, not for <laughs> new stuff going forward. If they're banking on 5.5 success being tied to the VTT, they're going to have a bad time. Yeah. Speaking of the whole idea of them, you know, not being able to come home and, you know, take the books off your shelf when they retcon stuff. Um, I actually don't think that's true anymore. No. <laughs> no. So Watsy, about eight days ago, we couldn't report on this when it happened, like last podcast, because we had a guest on. But I guess the, I guess the story you can correct me because I know you know about it too is somebody ordered March of the Machines, and instead of getting the March of the Machines, which is the newest Magic the Gathering set, 
He received March of the Machines Aftermath, which is like a mini set that comes out in a month or so. And he happened to get those delivered to his house, you know, shipping error in his favor. And then Watsy decided the best thing to do was to send the, I shit you not, Pinkerington police agents to his house, raid it, and take all the cards away from him. Yeah. And th- there's there's Watsy's side, there's the streamer's side, and there's the truth somewhere in the middle. But... <laughs> I am inclined to believe distribution error, because if you look at how many different SKUs there are for March of the Machines, colon, something, 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 Aftermath just looks like another product in that, so if some distributor didn't see the street date on it, totally believe it. Yeah. Do I believe that he didn't know it wasn't supposed to be out and he his 3,000 subscriber channel got it before anyone else when he opened the packs? No. But sending the literal Pinkertons, we have... <laughs> there's... Federal government literally has the anti Pinkerton Act forbidding them from contracting with the Pinkertons because of how brutal they were in strike breaking behavior. Um, and now Watsy's saying, Oh, yeah, we're going to compensate him. We were trying to get a hold of him. But. <laughs> They called him three times, and he didn't answer the call. Because it was an unrecognized number. Yeah. Do you answer unrecognized numbers? No. I mean, I do just to fuck with the people, but I, That's fair. most people don't. Yeah. I, I, every phone call I get is like, oh, this is a spam call, and I answer it. Just to see what the spam call is. The The car warranty spam has disappeared completely now. Oh, well. Um, all I'm getting now is basically some guy... And, like, the phone will pick up and it will click a few times. The obvious, like, oh, you're being transferred to the spam agent's person. And they're like, hi, we're interested in buying your house at blah, blah, blah address. No, I don't want to somebody else. Like, but it's a great time to sell your house, you know, with the housing market collapsing. (laughs) So I just, I just hang up. But it's weird how that's the, the scam now. Now, if you told me the scam was someone selling me, like, you know, unreleased aftermath cards i still want to buy them because they're just junk yeah yeah i mean to be fair the pinkertons haven't killed anyone since 2020 that's we know of that we know of i mean that's three years and there's only watsy's what is it director of security or risk management that used to work for the pinkertons directly um They've only used them a couple other times publicly. So, yeah, they're not going to come to your house and take your old books. Oh, yeah, definitely not. You know, I mean, heck, they didn't just retcon half the freaking Spelljammer book already. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess the Pinkering agents try to go to his house when no one was there. So they just broke down his door. (laughs) Oh, shit. Well, that's crazy. Also in the news, on more of an upswing, uh, there was the Guinness World Record of the D&D game, the largest D&D game ever. I saw that. Yeah. 1,228 people won, or sorry, 1,227 people won DM. Basically playing a game to basically beat up Vecna. And... I guess it's gotten the Guinness Book of World Records. It was held at like a a big convention hall. And I think what's most surprising about this is this is basically dead center Utah. So the center of Mormon country, which is. Utah's a little different than you'd expect. Yeah, but I don't, I just, I don't, I want to think you would find 12 D&D players in Utah, let alone 1,200. I guess you would I'm be wrong. really surprised. Yeah. 
but congrats to him. He's yeah. uh yeah. He's got his little plaque and everything. You know, I'm actually in two Guinness World Records. Really? Yes. Um it's I think I think this one's still standing. It was the largest secret Santa exchange ever. Oh, Reddit. Reddit. Yeah. yeah. Which they've now Back, stopped. Which they've now stopped, unfortunately. Um, but you could order the certificate, and that's where that's where Guinness makes its money. By the way, in case you didn't know, oh yeah, is when when you get a when you get a part when you're a part of a Guinness World Record, they like a big crowd, and then basically they sell you the piece of paper and the stupid frame for like three hundred dollars. Yeah, and that's where they make their money. Uh, I don't have the certificate because I at the time didn't want to spend three hundred dollars on it, but if I could get it, I would. Now, also, and this is local to us here in Charleston. Um, the Guinness record was up here, I think in 2019, maybe. Yeah. Sometime in 2019. Um, it was the world's largest sweet tea. Oh sweet. yeah. And that's the other Guinness record that we were a part of. We also got the, the email saying, Hey, if you want to buy this, the, the piece of paper, you can <laughs> give us $300. Yeah. So th- those are the two that I'm involved in. Nothing fancy, not like the biggest poop ever, but yeah. you know. I guess you gotta to call the up Guinness beforehand so they can record it. Otherwise, they won't believe it. Seventy-five Curex. <laughs> so, um, as a uh, general player with the upcoming swap over the system and everything, um, are you going to move away from fifth edition? Well, the reality of these things are the tables I can find, what do they move to? So, um, unfortunately, that's a lot of games that I think are really cool that I've never played because I can't find a group for them, like that Dragon Mech one. Um, I've played one very short-lived uh, Shadowrun campaign where... I was trying to DM having never played Shadowrun before because, well, we wanted to try it, but that was the first table I had found for it with people I gelled with. So, I guess it's a question of what is Grumpy Dungeon Master is doing. And honestly, I, I don't know. Like, as long as I can use D&D Beyond and keep the same sheets running i don't see a need to change from that you know yeah there's plenty there's plenty of classes out there that we have yet to explore different combinations out there that we really want if you really want to get crazy we can enable some homebrew stuff but we don't really need to so at the end of the day six edition 5.5 whatever d and done would have to be extremely compelling for me to go, okay, let's move over to that system and yeah. readjust everything that we know. Like I, I you, you were around for the 3.0 to 3.5 change. Yeah. So when that happened, and they also promised backwards compatibility at that time as well, too. How was that transition? It, it, it was okay. Um, there was less inertia. Because that wasn't that long of a run, and, well, we weren't ordering everything on the internet with next day shipping. So, it was kind of an easier transition to move over to 3.5, but the backwards compatibility was always kind of more of a pain than it really felt like it was worth it for. So, because... It was close enough, but there were so many little things that you had to adjust. And same sort of thing for going from 3.5 to Pathfinder, where, yeah, theoretically, but you have to do so much little number shuffling, and, oh, this skill was split, this skill was merged, and... I actually, as a DM... um, one of my early 5th edition campaigns was literally taking 1st and 2nd edition adventure modules and stringing them together. Because, surprisingly, because things were so different on a lot of the core mechanics, 
that was actually a lot easier to translate over to 5th edition than moving from 3rd edition, from 3.0 to Pathfinder was when I tried that a couple times. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of interesting. You So, just to clarify, you said that going to Pathfinder was easier. Yeah, going 100% to Pathfinder. Trying to pull in things that were backwards compatible and that... That was always a finicky mess. Yeah. So I do kind of worry with, let's just say, 5.5, that if someone wants to run Prince of the Apocalypse for some weird reason, um, that might be kind of a pain. Even just ignoring the balancing issues, just the translating abilities and everything could be unpleasant. Yeah. I mean... They're not calling it a new system because the math isn't changing, but like math is half the problem. Yeah. It just, yeah. I don't know. I'm just not getting. I'm not getting warm fuzzies from all this. Again, current Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro. I mean, you be careful. They'll send the Pinkerington police on you. <sighs> I mean. What's the worst they could do to D and D players? Can they take our dice? Well, dice are system agnostic, so they probably can't do that. They, they did put they did put their system in Creative Commons because they don't want to use it anymore. Yeah, so they can't really take away that. I know. That's they'll forever out there. They'll trademark the idea of a 20-sided die. And knowing Hasbro's level of lawyers, they'll get it so no one else can make D20s. That would be like the rudest thing they could ever do. Uh, that's actually one of the interesting things with Disney, because it kind of doesn't look like they're going to extend copyright again, but next year, Steamboat Willie, that version of Mickey Mouse becomes public domain. But if you noticed, a couple years back and going forward, they've taken that version of Mickey and put it into the, some of their logos. So now it's a trademark issue. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, January 1st, 2024, he enters public domain. Yeah. Corporate shenanigans. It's great stuff. Keeps us all employed. So they're losing copyright, but are keeping trademark, huh? Yeah. Now, how will that help? Will someone be able to make a grim and gritty um, Steamboat Willie movie like they did with Winnie the Pooh just recently? Maybe. I mean, have you seen any of the Steamboat Willie stuff? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's a, he's already pretty dark and grim there, pal. He is. If you want to look it up on your computer, uh, listeners at home, uh, yeah, just Google Steamboat, Steamboat Willie and Shotgun and let me know how that works out for you. <laughs> I don't want that in my internet history. Hey, maybe Benelli will start selling Steamboat Willie branded shotguns. <laughs> for that itch in the back of your throat. Steamboat Willie brand shotgun. <laughs> no <laughs> that's probably getting cut from the published first <laughs> probably not uh, so wrapping up here is there anything you want to as a player bring up to all the DMs out there any kind of gripes or issues you have with like the general DM populace uh uh, buffs are because better than nerfs. Of, I give you tons of time to, to think about this before I ask you to fill in. Oh, yeah. Generally, buffs are better than nerfs. Don't punish your players. Uh, try to be consistent in your rulings. Talk to each other. Kind of basic <laughs> interpersonal stuff, but... You're going to have to talk to people? I don't like this. 
Well, it it's cooperative storytelling, not an antagonistic system. Unless a succubony is involved. <laughs> Oh man, the next time one of our players makes a hair and gone character. <laughs> and it's probably it's really... gonna be some guest player who doesn't know. So, by the way, you have these special powers. You're actually a succubus. <laughs> and go. <laughs> so now now we have shapeshifters in succubi, which also kind of oh. fills in that too, but doppelgangers and succubi. Okay. Here here's a little peek behind the scenes curtain and you just it, that just triggered a thought for me. Okay. The amount of doppelgangers in this campaign was through the roof, maximum level of doppelganger. Okay. I shit you not, you came across at least six doppelgangers throughout this whole situation. But not once did you pursue any conversation or side story for the doppelgangers, no matter what I tried to do to steer you that direction. <laughs> like you guys like inherently knew subconsciously that, Oh fuck, I ain't talking to them. That's going to involve a doppelganger. <laughs> Consciously, I had no idea. It might just be the old problem of, oh, you walk into the bar and there's the mysterious cloaked figure with, with a map, and the players go, anyone else? Well, there's Bopsy, the goblin bartender. We want to talk to Bopsy. <laughs> now, it really wasn't that. It was just the opportunities were there for the doppelgangers to, to be a thing. And they just, you guys just never, they, I, I guess it just wasn't enticing enough. Yeah. Wow. And they weren't like they were main story points. They were all side quests, but yeah. like, they were also like rooms that had doppelgangers in them, like in the final encounter, you know, that you guys could have gone in. You just like, no, we're not going in that door. Fuck that door. <laughs> I don't know what's behind it. I have a bad feeling about this. Yeah, you want to know why? Because there's a doppelganger behind that door, and you guys are just like, meh, about it. Wow, I believe it. That last one was heist planning, though. Yeah, I tried to, I tried to give you guys a, a good amount of time to plan the heist. And when your stealth rolls are all like 30 plus, it's like, you sneaking fine. Just tell me how you sneak in. That's the joy of Pass Without Trace plus Blessing of the Trickster to buff the one guy wearing heavy armor. Yeah, it was it was pretty ridiculous. But I'm glad you guys had, had a lot of fun with it, and I'm glad you guys are done with that part of the story. Um, it should be a lot of fun moving forward. I hope you have a lot of fun with the other the other docks, and don't worry. It's not 100% Highlander, but it is now. It's 100% Highlander. I, just l I literally just realized, session before yesterday's, the when we were drunkenly distracting the Castle Lanterns and Doc was making impl implications about what Amalia was doing down at the docks, there are a swarm of docks around town now. That was not intentional. <laughs> it was now. <laughs> at the time, not at all intentional. Well, I'm, I'm glad, Dimitri, I'm glad you came in and fill in for Jay, and I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying the story, and thank you again for being my little rules lawyer at the table. Everybody needs to have one of you. You make playing the game so much so much less of a burden because I don't have to re remember everything and I can just rely on your encyclopedic knowledge. And thank you also for not using that knowledge against me. I like I like the small quips every once in a while when I mess something up, but you know I try to be a lawful neutral rules lawyer. <laughs> yeah, like like the one time when uh, you're like all right, well, I'm in this illusion. I'm going to run in and try to bluff this guy, even though I know 100% know he has true stuff. <laughs> and, like, you saying that, I, I, I find hilarious. And also lets me remember, oh, yeah, he has true stuff. <laughs> I'm not going to see through this. Or he's going to see right through this, I mean.
<laughs> so I appreciate it greatly. So thank yeah. you for filling in. Thanks for and, having me. Yeah. Uh, goodbye, everybody. Bye, Craig. Bye, Craig. Bye, everybody.